When you think of Atari 2600 sounds, you might be imagining basic calculator or pong noises. The sound capabilities were super limited, and very few games had background music during gameplay. But one company wanted to produce great tracks on the limited hardware, so how would this be possible? What's going on guys? It's Poger, coming at you with another video. Alright, we're going to be talking about music and Activision. Alright, so do me a favor. You see that subscribe button right there? Might be fun. Try hitting it. We're almost at 10k. We're trying to get there by the end of the year and only you can help make that happen. And don't forget, we got a Discord server. We got 170 members in there right now. Really happy about it. Just go to discord.poger.net. Anyway, these have been really fast. Let's get started. If you haven't met Pitfall Harry, you're missing the year's most incredible video game adventure. Pitfall for the Atari 2600 and in television. So let's talk about music in video games. In the earlier arcade releases before 1981, there was a limited offering of tracks. You might hear a 5 second tune when you start a stage, but otherwise there wasn't much except for the sound of your spaceship or the sound of enemies. But this would change with Namco's arcade title, Rally X. This title actually featured music during gameplay, which was a first. To me, it doesn't sound all that great, but it's a good start. In 1981, Nintendo would increase the standard of music even further. Yup, we're talking about Donkey Kong. It's only a two second loop, but it sounds alright and the standard wasn't that high yet. But Frogger would take things to the next level. This title features much longer tracks during gameplay. Not only that, but they sound great. It almost sounds like an ice cream truck. So the quality of music during gameplay was improving in the arcade world, but in the console world, not as much. The Atari 2600 ports of Donkey Kong and Frogger, for example, removed the gameplay music. In most other titles, both ports and console originals didn't feature any music during the action. Of course, there were some rare exceptions like the 2600 port of Popeye. So why didn't a lot of 2600 games feature gameplay music? Well, for one, the console only had two sound channels. Generally, if you're making music, you want to have more sound channels. The more you have, the more detailed your music can be. Two sound channels was not that much to work with, and it was near impossible to make good music with that. Secondly, the console already had memory limitations. The 2600 only supported 4 kilobyte cartridges, although bank switching would increase that limit, and the console only had 128 bytes, not kilobytes, of RAM. With such strict limitations, there probably was not going to be a lot of extra cartridge room to fit in music. But there is one company that thought they could do the impossible. After being unsatisfied with Atari, David Crane and three others left the company and formed Activision. With their new establishment, they started implementing changes that were not allowed at Atari. Their games actually credited the developers, unlike before. They really tried to make their games stand out from Atari's own offerings. Their boxes and gameplay looked very colorful, which of course is going to draw attention to them. Customers are more likely to buy them if the box stands out and the screenshots of the actual game look good. Speaking of screenshots, it's really bold that Activision was not afraid to show off their games right on the cover. It's great on their part that they're not trying to hide what you're actually getting. Activision was really trying to make games that were never thought to be possible on the 2600. Activision was really smart with their lineup of games. They made a title for pretty much every genre. There's a racing game, 
fight simulator, shooter, boxing, sports, and more. So they pretty much checked every box here. If you have an itch to play a particular kind of game, Activision's got you covered. Some of their games were meant to one-up Atari's versions. For example, Robot Tank by Activision is way better than Atari's Battlezone. Their flight simulator, Star Master, outclasses the 2600 version of Star Raiders in every way. Activision was definitely sending a message here that they can offer everything that Atari has and more. There's a few standout titles that are worth looking at. First, let's look at Plague Attack. As someone who has braces at the age of 31, I respect a game that's about keeping your teeth clean. Here, you have to keep the food from touching your teeth, and if it does, you lose it. If all of your teeth fall out, it's an automatic game over and you gotta buy dentures, I guess. Look at how many burgers this guy's eating. Maybe it's those really small gummy ones. Anyway, the controls are hard to get used to because you can shoot above and below, and sometimes you might accidentally shoot in the wrong direction. The game does get really intense when it progresses further. Overall, it's a really unique title and I admire the creativity here. Here's Crackpots. You play as a man who must keep the bugs from reaching the top. There's a few different types of bugs that each move differently, including straight, diagonally, and in a zigzag. Of course, the ones that don't move straight are much harder to kill. If too many bugs reach the top, you lose the bottom part of your building and you can continue from there. If the building gets too low, it's an automatic loss. I personally don't like that there's no way to regain the floors that you lost. I feel like you should be able to get it back after losing a certain amount of points, kind of like a free life. Either way, it's a decent title. Now for Kaboom. This is one of the first games people think of when they hear Activision, and it's one of their most successful games. Here, you have to catch the falling bombs with your buckets. If you miss any of them, they all explode and you lose one of your buckets. If you lose all of them, it's game over. Of course, the less buckets you have, the more difficult the game is. Honestly, this is very addictive and one of the best games on the console. And finally, Pitfall. When I mentioned games that were never thought to be possible, this is what I was talking about. You play as Pitfall Harry and you must obtain the highest score possible within the 20 minute time limit. There's 32 items you can collect across a total of 255 screens. This game really stood out from the pack for numerous reasons. The graphics, for one, are excellent for the console. Your walking animation is well detailed and the background forest looks great. I can actually tell what the setting is. Secondly, this is a big game for only 4 kilobytes of ROM space. They reuse a lot of the same screens numerous times to save on space and similar to River Raid, they keep track of the levels numerically. When you boot up Pitfall, an algorithm generates a set of numbers and determines where the level tiles go, and this saves a lot of ROM space in the process. So you're getting a big adventure game here, which is very uncommon for the Atari 2600. So anyway, while a lot of these games are great, we do have to acknowledge the limitations. None of these games have any background music during gameplay, and most of the titles don't have any scrolling, with a few exceptions. Because Pitfall was one of Activision's best-selling games, they set out to make a sequel. But how do you top a game like this when the standard has already been set so high? To make a successful follow-up to Pitfall, the best thing you can do is make it better than the first one in every single way. Pitfall 2 would come out roughly two years after the original, so at this point the developers were more experienced with the 2600. But they knew the native 2600 hardware would not be capable enough for the game they imagined, so they came up with an idea. Here's the display processor chip. This extra cartridge add-on gives the 2600 two extra sound channels to work with. With this chip, the 2600 is capable of producing high quality music. Remember, the more sound channels you have, the more detailed the music can be. So what did we get as a result? Alright, so at first it looks very similar to the first game, but in the first 30 seconds you'll notice some big upgrades. The screen actually scrolls vertically now, and we can see the game is much bigger than the first one. The music, as expected, is fantastic. It's amazing to hear music like this on the 2600. 
Like the first game, you want to get the highest score possible while collecting all the items. You have unlimited lives now, unlike the original, but every time you die, you lose points. Surprisingly, there's checkpoints in this game. Honestly, really ambitious that they added this feature. There's even animated water that you can swim in, which is impressive to see. One minor flaw with the first game is that because a lot of the screens are reused, you get a lot of repetition and it can be boring. With this game, however, because we get massive levels on a vertically scrolling playfield, we get a lot more content and therefore a much better experience. I did notice a lot of background patterns have been reused in this one too. I assume it's a save on ROM space. The controls are still very clunky like the first one. Maneuvering through the ladders takes some getting used to, and a few times I fell when I didn't mean to. And of course, you fall straight down. There's no way to control your direction mid-air. Despite the issues though, I can't blame the developers too much because there was no standard yet for platformers. Each game has 27 scrolling levels, each of which actually scroll down pretty far, so we get a lot of content here. Because of how much we're getting, it doesn't feel like an Atari 2600 game. I feel like I'm playing Metroid or some other NES game, and that's a big compliment for a console that came out in 1977. Overall, they improved the first game in every way possible. The original Pitfall was great, but it was repetitive and there was no scrolling or background music. This title, on the other hand, fixed all of those problems. This was a sequel that was done right. Unfortunately, because the game came out right around the video game crash, the display processor chip was never used again. This add-on could have been a game changer for future titles, but sadly, we never got to see it in action past this point. Hey, I just wanted to thank you so much for watching this video. If you made it this far, hit that like button. If you enjoy this type of content, hit the subscribe button for more content. Both of these things really help the channel grow. If you have anything to share, feel free to leave a comment. I read every single comment on this channel, and I'm pretty good at replying back. Anyway, have a good one.